Hi everybody. This is slide 183. I'm actually going to try to get through all of these, which I know some of you find incredible, considering <clears throat> what I get through in class. If you remember correctly, I'm going to try to go as quickly as possible through these slides now on these videos, so that when we are in class, you can watch these videos at home and see the PowerPoints at home. But we can talk about the grand scheme of uh, history at the time and talk about the Gilded Age and uh, talk about current events, all of those things a little bit more. So here it goes. Uh, Carnegie. We were talking about in class today how Carnegie then uh, was a captain of industry. You guys know this part. It's steel, Homestead Steel Works. But if you could replace this face today with Bezos. Bezos, just last week, I fixed my PowerPoint and it said $131 billion that Bezos has made. And then just yesterday, it updated or this morning or something like that, it says Bezos is up to $198 billion. $198 billion. I am responsible for that. I am partly responsible. I can't tell you how many times in the past six months that I've ordered from Amazon. I'm literally making this guy freaking rich and it doesn't make sense. I know that's a bad choice. And yet, if I order something not on Amazon, it takes maybe a week or a week and a half. But if I order through Amazon, it takes a day or two. So we are making this guy just easily the richest person on earth very soon. It's unbelievable. I think he is currently the richest man on earth. So we also have somewhat of a Gilded Age today where we have economics that are closer to law, say, for economics that the, the rich people are being able to buy legislation that they want in Congress through campaign donations and through super PACs to get people elected that will vote in their interests. Uh, the same thing happened back in the Gilded Age, starting with Grant, Hayes, Garfield, Arthur, and Cleveland, and Harrison. And Cleveland was a Democrat, but he still had laissez-faire policies. Uh, $8 billion, he donated $8 billion. You have to know that they were very philanthropic, uh, the captains of industry. Many of them have named universities after themselves. Belmont, uh, please, if you didn't write it down, Belmont is railroads. Carnegie is steel, Vanderbilt is railroads, Stanford is railroads, Duke, Lucky Strike Cigarettes is tobacco, um, Swift and Armor is meatpacking, uh, but they, Carnegie Hall, there's a famous music hall, if you sing at Carnegie Hall, then you really made it to the top. So even though they made museums or libraries or opera houses or universities, none of that benefited the poor. So it's philanthropic, but it didn't really benefit the poor. Okay, and then it says that the poor are lazy, that they are lazy and by giving them money that we are inspiring them to continue to be lazy, we still uh, attribute that to poor today, that poor just want to be on employment, they don't want to work, they want to get free money. But in reality, most poor people are working sometimes two or three jobs um, a, a week uh, now. Currently, people work two jobs. I know one of our uh, janitors works two jobs. She works in a nursing home all day and then comes here in the evening to clean the, the buildings and works two full-time jobs. Uh, they were taking care of babies and children, so they would have to do laundry for the rich people all day long. Okay, so you have to understand socialism, if you remember correctly, from our political barometer. Uh, over here is Social Democrats, that's where I reside, but then even more left of me is socialism, and even more left of that is communism and then anarchism. So socialism is uh, antithetical to laissez-faire economics. Socialism says that uh, the Big businesses should not be able to pay poverty wages of $7 a week or $8 a week or $9 a week. They pay children like a dime a day and children are working for like a dime a day. People are working 12, 14 hours a day, uh, children 10 hours a day. So socialists are people that came from other countries, almost always the immigrants from other countries that lived in authoritarian countries that had czars and kings and kaisers um, and they uh, are people that fought against the, the strength of those authoritarian regimes. So they came here and brought those same ideas with them of socialism and communism. 1848, Karl Marx, the Communist Manifesto, which is antithetical to laissez-faire economics where you get to do whatever you want, that the captains of industry can do whatever they want. Um, Henry George argued in Progress and Poverty, a book that he wrote, that people deserve the value they created, but that land belongs to humanity and should be taxed that the land belongs to everybody, not just the rich. We plow our fields, we open new mines, we found new cities, that means the people. We girdle the land with iron roads and lace the air with telegraph wires. We add knowledge to knowledge and utilize invention after invention. Yet, despite such tremendous progress, it becomes no easier for the masses of our people to make a living. On the contrary, it has become harder. And so he's saying that we work and we till and we mine, we do all of these things, and yet we get poorer. 
Uh, famously, the original Mon Monopoly game was inspired by Henry George's anti-monopolist book, Progress and Poverty. It was meant to show the vast disparity between the robber barons and the poor who, who barely made any money. Uh, during the mid-30s, Parker Brothers bought the rights to any games. It was called the Landlord's Game, uh, related to Monopoly. Patent Elizabeth Maggie still owned for $500 and no royalties. So she sold the game for $500, and now, as you know, many people still buy the game. 140 years later, people still buy this game Monopoly that they have made, like, <laughs> millions and millions of dollars from, and some lady made it 140 years ago and then sold it for 500 bucks and no royalties. In other words, she didn't get money every time somebody bought it. But it was to show the great disparity between wealth and poverty. Uh, it's ironic that the game which sought to teach equality should be turned into a game which promoted cutthroat capitalistic and predatory monopolies at the expense of others. As you know, uh, in the game you try to get as wealthy as possible and too bad for the poor people if you run them out of business and eventually they lose all of their money and they lose all of their land. Uh, Parker Brothers bought related rights to the Monopoly game uh, called the Landlord's Game for 500 bucks. Meanwhile, Charles Darrow became a millionaire while Maggie died broke in relative obscurity. So this guy made millions and millions of dollars by this game that this lady made, and she died broke. It's kind of ironic. Okay, Walter Rauschbusch and Washington Gladden preached the social gospel and that churches should tackle the social issues of the day. We have many churches today, many, many, many. People go on missions to poor countries. People uh, go to soup kitchens and feed the poor. Uh, that's what he's saying is that, that everybody should follow Jesus and his actions. Uh, that Christians should give to the poor and help the poor. And that's called the social gospel, that, that the, the churches should help, help, help everybody. Whoever uncouples the religious and the social life has not understood Jesus, according to him, that they are inextric inextricably tied together. Uh, the one injurious and fatal fact of our present church work is the barrier between the churches and the poorest classes. The first thing for us to do is to demolish this barrier. In other words, that we need to invite the poor into every single church, that they have a right to be there. Uh, Raj Bush and Washington Gladden preached the social gospel and that churches should tackle the social issues of the day. Okay, education in the late 1800s. You should know that um, in the earlier 1800s that there were maybe one-room schoolhouses, but most likely only the very rich educated their children. They had tutors or they had teachers that they could pay for their families and a few other rich families. But it wasn't until like the mid-1800s that we actually start having schools. And as, as all of you remember, like 120, 130 years ago, they had like one-room schoolhouses. So children of all ages from uh, four years old to 18 years old or 16 years old, nobody was 18 in a, a school then. Uh, four years old, about 16 years old, were all in one building. The older kids helped to teach the younger kids. Um, and then of course, African-Americans got left out. Uh, freed, freed men. By the late 1800s, free public education was firmly entrenched in America and increasingly America's poor and oppressed saw education as a means to a better life. Um, again, uh, Carnegie pulled himself up by his bootstraps through education and grit and determination and hard work. Horatio Alger is gonna write books about that if you just try harder, if you just learn more, then you can be successful, which is not true. Like a lot of them worked as hard as they could and they only stayed in poverty wages because there, were, there was no regulation on business, laissez-faire economics. Uh, public schools were created with free textbooks and all funded by taxpayers. There are 6,000 high schools in 1900. Uh, my grandfather was born in 1900, and there are 24,000 high schools today. Catholic schools also grew in numbers, and the reason they started having Catholic schools is because Catholics were scorned so much. If you remember, we talked about the immigrants, we talked about Italians and, and Irish. Nina, no Irish need apply, that they scorned the Catholics, so Catholics started opening up their own schools where they could teach their ideals. And of course, Southern freed blacks rarely received an education in the years after the Civil War. Uh, during the Reconstruction, they started making schools, started creating schools, but once the Union troops were pulled out uh, as the great betrayal, the Compromise of 1877, uh, there weren't schools in the Deep South for black people. Okay, you have to know Booker T. Washington, you have to know Booker T. Washington, you have to know Booker T. Washington, write it down. Booker T. Washington was an ex-slave. He ran the Tuskegee, he created the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama to teach black students useful trades. 
He taught them trades. So I love this part about Booker T. Washington is that he asked for land to be able to build his school. And then the, the Alabama gave him the land to build the school. But then literally they taught trades, uh, bricklaying, carpentry, uh, cutting meat, butchering, women sewing, uh, cleaning, all of these trades so that they could work their way up and get the white people to trust them and believe in them. And so they would do, he believed that we had to earn the respect of the white people. And so he did that through learning uh, valuable trades. And so when they built the Skiggy Institute, literally the students built the school by learning how to be bricklayers, learning how to be carpenters and, they, and electricians, and they built the school. Uh, you have to know about George Washington Carver. I think most of you know, peanuts, 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 that he came up with literally hundreds of inventions for peanuts, sweet potatoes, and soybeans. Famous. Uh, Washington believed if blacks earned economic equality, then social and political equality would virtually follow, so eventually follow. Um, he said that we should not try to get politically involved with white people, that we should just give them the respect they deserve, and that we will work our way into their endearing, endearing from them, being endeared. At the bottom of education, at the bottom of politics, even at the bottom of religion, there must be for our race economic independence. So even though he knew that they were seen as being the bottom, the bottom, the bottom, he still sought to gain economic independence, and then in the future they'd be able to work for uh, political economics. And he's going to argue and be, uh, this is going to be antithetical to what W.E.B. Du Bois believed. So you have to know about these two people. Um, Booker T. Washington believed in trades and not being political, and W.E.B. Du Bois believed in being political and being smart, the talented 10th. So he was the first black man to receive a PhD from Harvard and demanded immediate equality for blacks, political involvement. Colleges sprouted after the Civil War, some specifically for women, for blacks. Spelman College, I think you've heard of Spelman College. Um, they are historically black uh, schools and universities. Um, I think in, in Nashville there's a, a historically black college, HBCU. I don't remember what it is at this moment. Duke University was founded by James Buchanan Duke, other famous universities. Private donations to colleges grew as wealthy industrialists sought to support education. So again, these captains of industry would name colleges after themselves. Cornell U University founded by Ezra Cornell. I, don't, I think I've never looked up what Cornell did. So he's apparently a captain of industry. That's Ezra is probably a man's name but I don't know what Cornell did. I'll have to check. Could you check? Maybe you guys could check. Uh, University of Chicago is founded by Rockefeller. To his credit, he didn't name it Rockefeller University. It's called the University of Chicago, but it was founded by Rockefeller, Standard Oil. John Hopkins University, uh, first top-notch graduate school in the USA. It is medical, 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 medical. It's still the most famous school in the United States for medicine, John Hopkins. So the new morality and women, you have to know the differences about how women were sought, uh, seen in the early 1900s. The new morality of late 19th century reflected the liberal thinking and increased social and economic opportunities of urban life for women. Conservatives felt that women should be barefoot and pregnant, that they should stay home, they should take care of their family, they should uh, take care of the um, education as well as the religious instruction for their families that they should not go outside of the house and work, that it was a separate sphere. So this cult of domesticity was created. The cult of domesticity said that the women's place is in the home. Uh, cities gave women more opportunities to be independent economically and socially. This new morality was antithetical to that cult of domesticity. Antithetical means opposite the opposite of this separate sphere. A lot of women, this is of course the Roaring Twenties, a lot of women uh, started becoming more sexually free and they started using birth control and divorce and they sexually talked about sexual topics openly. Uh, that was definitely new morality. Most very conservative people and women would never ever do that. That's the cities, always the cities where the bad stuff is, in the cities. Uh, this is Camille Clifford, she is considered the, the Gibson girl. A Gibson girl was tall, slender, you went with, yet with ample bosom, hips, and bottom. In the S-curve, you guys have always heard about an S-curve, torso shape achieved by wearing a swan bill corset. 
Um, her neck was thin and her hair piled high upon her head in a bouffant. Women entered the workforce. The Gibson girl represented these new confident women that worked in, in um, businesses as secretaries and everything. So they were meant to be alluring as well. Also the opposite of the cults of domesticity where they believe women should stay home. Like this. Most women did not achieve this final financial freedom of a Gibson girl. They lived in a separate sphere than men. This is known as the cult of domesticity. So this woman, uh, her main job is to take care of the family. So you should know in this cult of domesticity and that in the late 1800s and early 1900s that the middle class had servants. Middle class. Yes, of course, the wealthy, of course, the super rich, of course, the captains of industry had hundreds of servants in their houses. But even normal families had two, sometimes three servants. And it was the woman's job to manage the household. That didn't mean to take care of her kids. That didn't mean to clean the house. It meant to take care of the servants who did all of those things for her. Um, many women were very disgruntled by it. When we get to the 1960s, it's gonna be a lot more uh, well known that women are gonna start burning their bras and they're gonna be opposed to uh,